Do you remember when Disney show stars would like be on a show that has nothing to do with singing and then all of a sudden like they're releasing their own album? Like, they got their own music video that plays right after the clip of the guy showing off his like Pez dispenser collection. I'm not sure why every Disney show star, you know, ended up getting like their own record deal. I, I know that it's mainly just because Disney wanted to sell more CDs to children. You know, I always thought that that was kind of funny. And when I realized that it doesn't stop at Disney Channel stars and it expands to even adult actors as well you know that's when things get kind of a, a little interesting because instead of like a big corporation like just trying to sell more things to children it's just like an adult actor who's just trying to sell themselves the idea that they're not just an actor now that's not inherently a bad thing i mean you know of course everyone wants to be like a multi-hyphenate right now it's just when it's it doesn't quite click you know that's when you know <laughs> That's when it can be an issue. Now, there have been actors that have actually had some successful music. Eddie Murphy, for example, released a song called Party All The Time. Fantastic at the time. The song was off of his debut album that he was releasing in 1985 and actually did really well in the US, reaching number two on the Hot 100 charts. And the fact that it was only made based off of a bet that Eddie Murphy had with Richard Pryor about Eddie Murphy's singing abilities, it gives a great song a great story and goes to show what happens when a great actor makes a great song, uh, which sometimes may not always be the case. You know, it's been making its rounds. It's getting quite popular in like 80s party, like playlists and stuff. But for every Eddie Murphy, there's a Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis, a famous dead man, once released a single called Respect Yourself off of his album Return of Bruno, which I don't know who Bruno is. I believe it's his alter ego, his like stage name. I don't know where he went. I don't know where he returned from. I hope he goes back. And the song reached number five in the United States, which is pretty surprising, although it makes sense when you consider the U.S. was self-flagellating for electing Reagan a second time. <laughs> Now, the song itself, while produced well and actually had some talent behind it, like the Pointer Sisters, it just couldn't break away from the novelty that it was Mr. Yippie Kaye Mother Father uh, singing to you about respecting yourself. Comes off a. Uh, I don't think this is anyone's favorite song, but it's definitely not the worst example of an actor turned attempted musician. That's uh, that's this next guy. This next guy uh, is um, uh, Joe Pesci. You know Joe Pesci. He's uh, half of the Sticky Bandits. Uh, he's a pretty decent fella. He actually originally wanted to be a lounge singer, which, um, you know, he, he did attempt. Uh, you know, he actually had, you know, a pretty, pretty interesting music career. You know, he actually helped form the band uh, The Four Seasons. He had a part in the band that he played guitar for. And he, when he left the band, and he was actually replaced with Jimi Hendrix, which is pretty great when you consider the career that Jimi Hendrix ended up having. After that, I believe he became a famous cellist. So after all of that, you know, he you know did his acting for a couple of decades. He decided to retire, and he wanted to go back to his roots of music. So he released an album called uh, Vincent LaGuardia Gambini Sings Just For You. It was uh, named after his character from My Cousin Vinny. He is the titular Vincent, or Vinny for short. The most notable song on the album is a song called wise guy very on brand for joe pesci for the whole mob mafia thing he makes this song and i know that you're thinking well you know it is a joe pesci song you know given the history that we've briefly gone over it seems like this might be you know maybe like a frank sinatra cover album you know maybe he's got a couple original lounge songs you know very silky smooth as much as he can um well i no uh no that's incorrect um he released uh the song wise guy it's a rap it's his version of like a gangster rap it's like a mafia rap every day that goes by that i know that this song exists um it gives me nightmares the song itself is just crazy disrespectful towards women hey, hey, 
The second line of the entire song is treat all my broads like trash, which, uh, you know, on its own is very uh, discriminatory. But let's not bypass the first line of the song, which sounds very much like eat hey, out my yeah, ass. Hey. And while Google uh, says that the line is actually paid out my ass, I'm going to ignore that mainly because I just personally love the mental image of somebody tossing Joe Pesci salad. I'm going to keep that just for me. And now for my favorite parts of the music video, uh, there's two women sensually lip syncing to the lyric, it's the bitches that'll get you. It's a bitches that'll get you. Which as mentioned before is insanely disrespectful towards women. But the fact that we see these two ladies like, like lip syncing to the song, but then like Joe Pesci's voice comes out of their mouths. It's a bitches that'll get you. It's fucking hilarious to me. I also love how he's just sitting there so still while he reads his lines. Like, he almost looks embarrassed that he has to do this, although I can't tell for sure because the quality of this video is equivalent to a fucking rock, so you can't necessarily distinguish his emotions, but um, I doubt there are many there to distinguish from. Now, this has to be my favorite edit of the whole video. You'll catch a blast if you move too fast, I he really does move too fast. Almost scarily fast, if we're being completely honest. I also love how they took Mr. Rogers' most famous song and just completely fucked it up and just throw in like a drive-by shooting reference. Oh, I'm a wise guy. I'm a wise guy. Truly unbelievable. I don't drive by because I'm a wise guy. I just stop by. Wait a couple of guys, and I take your eyes. Now, when he says that he'll take my eyes, I'm imagining that he rips my eyeballs out, pops them in his mouth, and chews them nonchalantly while setting a car on fire. I just want to know if I'm alone in that thought, um, or, you know, if other people share in that same mental image when hearing Joe Pesci sing or rap that lyric. Is it just me? And I take your eyes. With a couple of guys. And those were my favorite parts of the music video. There weren't many. In the song, he goes on to describe such cool events as uh, telling the president that he'll call him back because he's so cool and so popular and important. Put the president on hold. Tell him I call him back. And then he um, uh, hits someone's brother with a truck. Brother didn't like me. I never gave a my brother didn't like me, I hit him with a truck. The sister was a rip, everybody got a ride. The father was a rat, so I buried him alive. He buries somebody's father alive. This is after he describes murdering two women and leaving their bodies uh, floating in ponds because their fathers had stocks and bonds. Two supermodels, one on each arm, one chick brunette, the other was blonde. I heard their fathers had stocks and bonds, so I f***ed them up and left them floating in a pond. Which, I guess, is a warning for all you ladies looking at Joe Pesci as a potential mate. Um, if your father has invested in GameStop, run away for Joe Pesci may murder you. Now, while this is not the only song on this album, uh, it is the most notable. The only other song that I can even you know, remember off the top of my head is the Hey Vinny song where, you know, basically it just sounds like the opening number to a My Cousin Vinny musical, which the fact that we have not gotten that yet um, haunts me every night even more so than Wise Guy does, which I, that's a lie. Nope, doesn't haunt me as much. Probably, probably uh, close second, but not, it hasn't quite gotten there yet. Another actor turned musician adjacent uh, is Vin Diesel. Uh, yeah, that's uh, Mr. Speedy and Angry himself. He is Ruth. Vin Diesel uh, released a single called I Feel Like I Do, which I think is kind of funny because I feel like he shouldn't. This song sounds like what it sounds like when you mess with your car, like stereo options, and you turn the trouble up just way too high. Um, it also sounds like when you like turn on a gas stove and you leave it on light and it's just, you know, ticking at you uh, just menacingly. It makes my ears feel like they're being spit on by very passive aggressive ghosts. 
it's got the instrumental of both an old Navy ad, uh, as well as like the intro music to a 12 year old's OBS tutorial on YouTube. That's you know like predominantly watched by 40 year old men who are trying to do Twitch for the first time because they believe that their Minecraft commentary is entertaining enough to support their crippling Red Bull addiction. And he sounds like he just full on housed a peanut butter sandwich just seconds before he stepped in that recording booth and they had no milk available, not a drop, not chocolate milk, strawberry, not straight from the cow's breast, nothing. But luckily for us, this is not the only time that we get to hear the sweet, sweet sounds of Vin Unleaded's beautiful voice. We just so happen to be lucky enough to have a heartbreaking cover of Rihanna's song, Stay. I feel like I should issue a correction for the last sentence because when I say heartbreaking, it's because his voice sounds so low and bassy that it registers as a 9.6 on the Schaefer scale. And uh, I guess cover wouldn't really be exactly the best word to describe what he's doing here because he's basically just Vin Diesel like singing over Rihanna in a small room, which is reminiscent of a karaoke night put together by guys who just do not know how to Google the word karaoke. I genuinely feel bad for the people that he made film this. Given the angle, they look to be shorter than Vin Diesel, which probably means that he got like his nephews or something to film this for him. I can't imagine that any professional would have this many shots out of focus. So you know he's not paying them. And I, I certainly hope that there's more than one person there because if they made that one person shoot it three times in separate angles, um, I'm just surprised they didn't just straight up eat the camera by the end of it. Finn seems to care about his music, but probably not as much as the last guy that we're going to talk about today, uh, Mr. Billy Bob Thornton. Billy Bob Every Rose has its Thornton. Mr. Thornton Hears a Who. Um, he has a band that he formed in 2007 called the Boxmasters. It's like a kind of country, kind of rock band. You know, they were like touring with Willie Nelson. They do an interview for this radio station, and I feel so bad for the interviewer because he's just lobbing over these super easy questions, and Billy Bob is just bunting them. You guys formed only in the last couple of years, right? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Every time, he's just bun, bun. And the interviewer is just trying to proceed with the interview. Well did when when did the, when did the band form? I'm not sure what that means. What does he mean by that? I don't know, Billy Bob. I guess he's asking uh when the fuck did you start your band? It's a pretty simple question, you self-righteous piece of shit. Oh, well, when did you guys first start playing together? Uh we started about 2 years ago. So, the bandmates are like picking up the slack. This is something that they are used to uh and and you, you've you've made three records in that time we've actually made about five records like do you just want to like ruin some like interviewer's day like does this is this the kind of thing that like excites you mr big bang theory i don't get it and so you know the interview goes on mixed with the stuff like buck owens and and um Del Reeves and stuff that we right. listened to. Anyway. And that was true for you, Billy Bob, growing up. It was a, a sort of a combo of Stones and Monkeys and and Buck Owens. I just liked baseball when I was a kid. <laughs> and you almost became a professional baseball player, right? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. So I'm editing this right now, and I just realized that that monitor says, um, if this really goes sideways, I have new Neil, new Magic on standby. So they knew that this interview was not going well, and so they had a backup option just in case. They had to just completely trash the whole interview. I think that's absolutely hilarious, and I just noticed that. I, I subscribed to a magazine called um, 
famous Monsters of Filmland, which uh, the publisher was a guy named Forrest J. Ackerman, who passed away recently. Do you remember what you were you were listening to musically when you were a kid? Well, they had a contest where you could build your own model, and it could be like a King Kong, or it could be uh, it could be anything from something that you created yourself to like one of the monsters that was actually in the. Uh, well, you know, in, in some of the, of the magazines, like a, it could be Frankenstein all the way to Phantom of the Opera. They, they made these plastic models in those days uh, that you could buy uh, and put together. But these, this was like a thing you could create your own world. Again, make, make telephone poles, make uh, railroad drives, everything. And um, I actually uh, did it every once. I didn't win anything, but, um, but I gave it a shot. And, uh, but Billy Bob's talking about just a fucking magazine from when he was a kid. That has nothing to do with the questions that he's asking. He's like doing like the politician thing of like, don't answer the question you're asked. You know, answer the question you wish you had been asked. Uh, I'm the, and what and where's the music? Where's the music fit into that? Uh, music. <laughs> No, it was, a, it was a monster magazine. Right, right. So he's talking about this like movie magazine, and so the guy's like, all right, well, I guess you don't want to talk about your music, and he gets super pissed that he brings up that he's an actor. Are you reacting to the fact that I said Yeah, I am, I am, since you're instructed not to talk about shit like that. Yeah, I am reacting to that, yeah. <clears throat> I wasn't instructed to... Uh, I'm, in, I'm, instruct, I'm not really instructed. You guys are here as a band. You're performing, mm. uh, but I... Well, I, the producer was instructed. By the way, the radio station, like managers and shit, like after the fact, confirmed that the interviewer was not instructed as such. He could have mentioned it all goddamn day long, and it shouldn't matter because as the interviewer, he's in control of the interview, and he can ask whatever questions he wants. If you feel uncomfortable with a question, you obviously don't have to answer it. You know, you can walk away. You can say, I'm not comfortable answering that. But when you're lobbed these easy fucking questions, and you're just going to sit there pretending like this is your first interview ever, like it just makes you come off as a complete prick this interview was so crazy and fucked up that it inspired a sketch of i think you should leave in the second season which is crazy to think about and they didn't have to change that much to this interview which especially when you consider that this is the show that gave us coffin flop that they did not have to change much to this you know to this interview to make it fit in with the rest of the show. I guess the moral of the story is, don't be a silly Billy, be a Vinny. Don't take your music too seriously if you're an actor first and a musician second. Make it, you know, just something that you're passionate about and don't be a fucking dick about it, please. Or else people are gonna rip you to shreds or shreds you to rips. So that is pretty much it. Thank you so much for sitting through this that I had to sit through. Um, I will talk to you at some point in the future. Goodbye.